Pushkin. Today is the first of two episodes featuring a musical genius, multi-instrumentalist Jacob Collier. In 2011, when Jacob was only 17, he began posting videos to YouTube of himself singing and playing music. They were a massive hit. His breakout video, a rendition of Stevie Wonder's Don't You Worry About a Thing, received millions of views and praise from musical legends like Herbie Hancock, David Crosby, and even Quincy Jones. Since then, he's gone on to release five albums, including his 2016 debut In My Room and 2022's Piano Ballads, an 11-track album of improvised piano pieces he played at various shows during a recent tour. Throughout his career, Jacobs collaborated with artists like SZA, Coldplay, Ty Dolla Sign, Tori Kelly, Daniel Caesar, and her. He's also won five Grammy Awards and is the first UK artist to win a Grammy for each of his first four albums. On today's episode, Bruce Tedlam speaks with Jacob Collier about the making of his latest live album, his creative process, and his musical admiration for Stevie Wonder. Jacob also plays piano throughout the two episodes, illustrating advanced musical concepts. These conversations with Jacob are the world's most interesting music theory class ever. A master class. This is Broken Record. Liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Bruce Hedlum and Jacob Collier. Jacob Collier. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you here. You know, as part of your quest to remake all of Western music. Oh gosh, is that my quest? It seems to be your quest. You're very busy. That was the old Elvis tune. Yes, indeed. And that's from your new album, Piano Ballads. Sure. Which first tell me just a little bit about the album, and then I have many, many questions about what you just played. But first tell me just the idea behind the album. Sure thing. Okay, so I've just been on tour this year, which has been very cathartic, especially after COVID. And I've done 70 shows so far. One of the challenges that I set myself in order to kind of keep myself on my toes, was in every show, I was to play a a different piano ballad. And the the rule was, this piano ballad was totally improvised. Uh, As long as I know the song, I I let whatever comes out, come out. And that is what it is. And so many of the the ballads on tour, I'd actually never rehearsed or played ever before. And I sat on stage in the show and I thought, right, I'm going to do a rendition of X or Y or Z. And, um, just kind of see what happens. And it was very interesting just to, to follow my energy throughout the, the tour and see which, which ballads kind of ended up connecting with me and, and connecting with the crowd. And I, I really loved the experience so much that I thought it would be nice to, to share a kind of vignette of my most favourite ballads. So I, I released this album about a month ago now, and it's um, 11 of the 70, and it's my absolute favourite uh, ballads thus far. I'm, I'm going to keep on doing this throughout the, the, the rest of the year of touring. But that song, which I, I always think of as, as being called Wise Men Say, but actually it's called Can't Help Falling in Love. It's uh, yeah, one, one of the greatest songs uh, that, that I've ever encountered. I performed that on tour actually using my vocal harmonizer, which is an instrument that I had custom built. Uh, I, I collaborated with my very dear friend, Ben Bloomberg, and we, we built this instrument together. And there's a performance of the song through that instrument. It's like a, almost like a vocoder. Uh, but I thought today I would play it on the piano because I've, I've never done that before. So that was a, a spontaneous rendition. Do you remember the first time you heard that song? I can't remember the first time I heard that song. It was probably a few years ago. It's such a classic tune. And so many people have reinvented it with, with such vigor and, and personality. So I, I've always been drawn to the song, but I've, I've never really thought to do it until now. But that song was special on tour for another reason, which is that across the, the US portion of the tour, in every show of the tour, I had the audience sing one word from that song. And so in Portland, they sang... Um, wise and then in Vancouver they sang man and then in Seattle they sang say like this and it went on like this and it it just so happened by complete coincidence that uh, by the final show of the tour which was in Columbus we'd done every word of the song exactly to the number which is Mm. completely unplanned (laughs) but um, what I then did when I got home was string all the cities together and you have this great big long rendition of the song which is about 100,000 people singing together which is such a, a philosophically dreamy and sound uh, idea in my mind. And so I actually just, I, I released the, the video of that a, about a week ago now, because I, I actually had every member of the audience 
record themselves singing the word with their phone. And there was a QR code hanging above the merch table at every show. And so at the end of the show, the audience members would scan the videos into the QR code and, and send them to me at home. And when I got home, I compiled, it was over 10,000 submissions of different videos. And in total, the number of singers was, as I say, about 100,000. And I spent a lot of time editing all of that audio together and worked with an incredible uh, video team whose name is Light Sail, and they and I edited all these little faces. So if you if you watch the video, there's all these little um, mosaic tiles of these audience members, each from each city, singing each word of the song. There's something, in, I think, in that song that everyone can connect to, you know. There is something listening to this album and re-listening to it, despite your technical skill, which we're going to get to in a minute, hmm. there's something very old-fashioned about <laughs> people singing sitting around a piano, it happens to be you at the piano, but there's something very, and maybe it is a post-pandemic feeling, something very comforting about it. Mm. Oh, well, for me, I, I definitely feel comforted. I think to me, I've, I've spent much of my life and career making these kind of multi-layered tapestries of sound. And for me, it's always been such an important place to kind of learn, but also to share just by sitting at the piano and playing. And so... Um, yeah, it felt like a, a, an important thing on the tour just to have a moment in amongst the, the chaos of the full production because tour is a, is a vast thing. You know, there's six of us in the band, there's lights, there's staging, there's about 100 musical instruments on the stage and we're all hopping around between all of them. It's, it's a lot of fun. But this moment in the show where I just sit and play a song on the piano feels, as you say, kind of intimate, comforting and, and rather old fashioned. Mm -hmm. The anticipation of the crowd you can feel when they recognize the song, mm, yeah. firstly, and then they're invited to sing. So right, seems of course. tremendous release for them. Yeah, yes, I think so. I, I, I love it when everyone sings together. Now, I want to ask a little bit about when you sit down at the piano in one of these concerts and you think, I'm going to play this song. Do you know the key you're going to sing it in when you sit down? No, I normally decide at the end of the introduction. <laughs> so I'll sit and play a few <laughs> notes and it's like following your nose. You know, you think, oh, I'll play, you know. Oh, and then... And then suddenly I'm in F sharp. I don't know why, but that just fell out, you know. So, so oftentimes I'll I'll start playing and I'll play for a couple of minutes. And sometimes I haven't even decided what song I'm going to play, you know, mm -hmm. until the end of that introduction. And I think, do you know, what? I think I'm going to do How Deep Is Your Love, or I think I'm going to do Caledonia or whatever. Yeah, and the other thing I like to do, just because it's fun and sometimes it really helps tell the story of the song, is is change key throughout. So you may start in one key and then move to a different key as as the song continues. If I'm taken there. So one thing you were doing, and I'm not sure if you did it this time, you're modulating yes. from key to key. Yes. And you're also reharmonizing. Mm, that's true. Can you just briefly explain what that means? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll hop to the piano. So, so uh, modulating is the idea of moving the, the gravity of home, right? Like musical home. So it, with this song, if I do Wise Men Say... This is my home. I'm in F major today. Mm -hmm. If I went, wise men say, that's a different key. That's in D flat. Or, wise men say, I'm in A now, right? Mm -hmm. So on the piano, we have 12 keys, and there's all sorts of ways to move between them. But one of the things I really like to do most is, yeah, as I say, to, to find a way from one key to another. And it, it can feel really like a, a big lift when you change key. What's the hinge you use to move from one key to another? You know, in modulation, they hear it at the end of songs, you know, Willie Nelson goes up a tone or goes yeah, up yeah, half a great. tone. Yeah. Uh, are you just looking for common tones between the notes? Because you don't, you don't just modulate up a tone. Like, you're, you're just not there for a, like, slightly higher y yeah, value. Right. You're, you're like, there's a different degree of difficulty. Yes. So when you're, when you're moving from one key to another, what's the signal that you can do it? What I find myself doing is building bridges from one key to another. So say, for example, if I'm in F, which I am... This note A, mm -hmm. right? A exists in, in other keys besides F. So, for example, D, right? A is at home in D major and in F major. So it lives in both, both worlds, right? So, there are all sorts of ways you can move between keys. But if I end up singing an A, if I go falling in love. Right, then I've moved, changed. But the mm -hmm. A was my bridge from one to the other, you know. So okay. it's almost like visualizing, yeah, different, different kind of tributaries away from the river that you're s sailing down, and then kind of having faith that you'll find a way there. Because a, a lot of the things that happen when you improvise happen by chance, 
And if you're too contrived about it or even too thoughtful about it, then it can, it can remove the, the, the natural storytelling of the thing. I mean, I spent many hours of my life sitting at the piano and thinking about these different sounds and how they connect to each other. But when I sit on stage and sing a song, I'm not thinking about any of that stuff. I'm just singing the song. Mm-hmm. And it may, it may end up that I find myself starting in F and ending in D flat. You know, It might just be one of those days. And you can, you can turn off the, the more deliberate part of your brain to do that? Well, it, to me, it's a bit like talking the English language. I'm not consciously thinking as I'm talking to you about grammar or spelling, you know, even though those things are helpful to think about when I'm learning how to put my language together. It helps me contextualize things. But well, when I'm talking to you now, I'm, I'm, I'm improvising mm-hmm. based on my syntax, my sort of internalized syntax, which comes from people I've listened to talk and time I've spent thinking about words and writing words and practicing talking a lot at home when I was a kid, you know. So it, it's a similar approach, I think, to playing. I can tune into what the chords are. You know, I know, for example, that the A is, is a third. I, c- I could describe it as a third. But it's also just the note. You know, it doesn't have to be called a third or have a name at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but I understand the kind of emotional properties of that note and all the ways it can move. And, and you can follow those things. So it's melodies, harmonies, rhythms, it's, it, all these things kind of connect. But yeah, I, I don't tend to be particularly thoughtful on, on stage. Sometimes there are days where I am, and I think those are the days where I'm, I'm, in, I'm in myself, you know, I'm, I'm within my own world. And it's, it's sometimes harder in that space to really tell a story and connect with a room. I think there's an old expression in jazz, now it's time to forget all that shit and just play. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Couldn't have put it better myself. So that's modulating. We didn't talk about reharmonizing which is something you do. When I say you're remaking Western music, you're essentially reharmonizing Western music, as far <laughs> as I can tell. It, it is one of my hobbies, yeah. Show me one of two of the things you did to reharmonize that tune. So this tune goes... Right. It's a very simple tune. It's nice because every note, of, I've just realized, every note from that song is actually in, in one scale, the major scale. It's a very lovely and welcome sound to most ears. So... When you think about harmonizing, and this I might get a bit nerdy here, but when you think about harmonizing, you're essentially departing home and arriving home. That's like, in a nutshell, that's what you're doing with a song like this. So basically, I'm going... That's what I'm... That's the journey, in, mm-hmm. a, in, a, in a very, very crude sense. So there are all sorts of ways you can depart from home, right? And when we think about harmonization, it's easy and pleasurable to think about, for example, the idea of localities, you know, keys that are neighbors to F. And I think that the two most kind of, um, most sound neighbors to F, uh, if F is our chord one, you could say is chord four, which is B flat, just around the corner, and chord five, which is around the other corner, right? And actually, if you can play chord one, four, and five, you can play almost every song that's ever been written, because so many songs are made from those chords. And there are all sorts of permutations of these chords. So even if you just take the chord F major, if you reorganize the notes in that chord, then you have what's called inversions of the chord, which are like different sensations, different ways in which that chord can feel. So we call this one root position, like its most grounded form. This one is slightly more, it's like, um, it's perhaps on its way somewhere. It's still grounded, but it's, it's on its, it's moving. It's, it's not stable because the third, the A is in the bass. Right? So it, maybe it wants to go there, right? It wants to move. And then the final one, it's actually, I really like this inversion. This is called second inversion. And it's when we have the fifth in the bass. And I really like this inversion because it's like you, you are arrived, you are here, but you're not really, you're not here. You're just kind of perching. Right? You're, 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 you've arrived, but you're, you haven't fully arrived. and. And so when I think about these chords and harmonization, reharmonization, I'm using these chords as kind of emotional devices to, to tell stories. So the idea of how home you are, that's a concept that is not, that's not musical in nature. That's human. It's a human concept. I, I'm this amount pulled home or I'm this amount safe or, or this amount stable. You know, th- these are things that we understand as, as people. And so you, you as a harmonizer have all sorts of devices as to how how you want to move people. So, say with these first three notes, well, I could just do, and that doesn't go anywhere really, But or I could just do, 
which is a, a slightly sweeter version of, again, not really going anywhere. But if I went... Then I've moved somewhere. And that's a bit drastic from perhaps the first phrase of the song. Mm -hmm. But F, which exists in F major, also exists in D flat major, which is where I just went to. And that's cool because D flat major is actually, it's quite foreign to F major, it's quite a far away key. And so what you can do when you harmonize is you can really take people by surprise, right? I mean, a chord like that, it's, it's very austere. It's a kind of bittersweet chord because these notes are tugging on each other and th these notes are stable. And that note is, is sour, you know, compared to the sweetness of this, right? You think, oh, ooh. And I mean, again, it's, it's just storytelling. Tell me, what's the chord you're playing then? This chord, well, it's... You could call it an, a, B, a B major 7 sharp 5. So it's a B major with a 7 in it and a 6. But the 5th, which is this, is actually sharpened. So it's, it's what we call like an uh, or, or augmented chord, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And augmented chords are naturally quite, uh, yeah, quite stretched and open. It's like a sort of an unnaturally large uh, open gap. But if I, if I were to do that... I think, oh, I've really made some contrast. And now when I go... And you start to really paint pictures, and you, you create tension, and you release tension. And so, you know, this obviously when you're practicing this and, and sitting at the piano, you, you're thinking, you know, okay, what are these chords? How do they fit together? What are my common tones? But when you sit on stage and improvise, you're just painting a picture from, from your mind, you know? So it's a, 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 sp a split second decision. Sweeten it up, lead it home away from home, heading towards home. And I'm not going to change key because I feel like it. Sweeten. I've changed key. Change key again. <laughs> So I actually started in F and then I went to D flat and then I went, ended up in E flat, which I didn't really plan. But, but these, these kinds of things happen not only when you have, uh, you, you've acquired a language of sorts, but also mainly when you're just fearless enough to give stuff a go. You think, oh, what would happen if I did this? And then you, you try. And sometimes it's great and sometimes it's, it's horrendous, you know, but I'm kind of here for all of it. And I think that one of the joys of touring in this way is that all the imperfections of figuring this stuff out in real time, it's all shared as an experience. It's, mm -hmm. I'm not keeping this to myself or it's, it's just for me to hear in my practice room or in a closed environment. I think you always learn most when you put yourself in the real world and, and learn a skill. And I think that for me, this experience on tour was almost like a determination to learn this, how to do this freely and, and truly be comfortable with whatever... It kind of gets thrown at me, whether it's something in my own mind or a song or something from the audience or whatever. It's, it's a, a, a practice of being very present and kind of awake to yourself. Reharmonization, particularly chord substitution, is a big feature of jazz. Yeah. Were there players you listened to that inspired your interest in chord substitution or was it just something that you always had? Yeah. I mean, there are so many people. Even if you think of someone like Stevie Wonder, you know, Stevie Wonder is one of these extraordinary humans who writes these really universal songs, but even within his own songs are really dense, colorful chords. And he's really kind of been able to bridge the gap between this, this dense, emotional, harmonic language and, and kind of just this universal songwriting. But when I was a teenager, there's a group called Take Six that I'm sure you're familiar with. And sure. They're just an unbelievably killing group of, it's like a six part gospel jazz singing group. And the kinds of chords that they would come out with, you know, a chord just like, you know, this kinds of 13 chords and stuff like that. I hadn't really heard anyone do what they did until they did it. You know? And it wasn't just their own original music. It was the way that they reimagined songs. Like they got a Christmas album called We Wish You a Merry Christmas, I think it's called. It's a great title for a Christmas album. 
and they would take songs that I, I knew as a kid, but they would put a spin on the songs harmonically that just completely blew my mind. And so I think that gave me permission as a child to think, oh, so it's cool to do that then. I can, I can take a song like, you know, Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star or Isn't She Lovely or whatever it happened to be and work out a way to do this in my own harmonic way. So when I was a teenager, I, I got so deeply kind of really, really into and, and obsessed with the idea of taking a a melody and harmonizing it in crazy ways. And there was one arrangement I did of a, of a Stevie tune called Don't You Worry About a Thing. You know, that's a... That song. And there's a bit in the middle where it goes... Right? And I remember thinking, oh man, that would be fun to reharmonize because it's just a chromatic scale, you know. How does he harmonize it? He sort of goes, right, right, and then I harmonize it, but something like that. The fun of that was thinking if, if you remove any idea, any concept of functional harmony, like you remove the idea that we're in any key or that any chords need to belong within each other's families, you just take every note. on a journey. I mean, that's very dense harmonically, but for me, especially at that age of 17, 18, when I was really getting into this, this was so important for me to do these kinds of experiments because I was discovering chords that I didn't understand. My ear would find a chord, like even this chord. I mean, it's not really a name for that chord. I mean, you could say it's a chordal voicing that's made of fourths, or you could say it's like a C major seven over the major. I mean, it's a strange chord, basically. It doesn't really have a name, but it has a feeling, and I love that feeling. And so, if, if every one of these notes moves to a satisfying place, regardless of your key center, I mean, that again, is, it's a quite a foreign chord, it's A flat minor over F. You know, every, every note has a pathway, like a, a journey. So when you reharmonize that part yeah. of that song, you weren't actually thinking in terms of chords. You were just moving your fingers... Until you got the sound you wanted? I would say I was thinking in terms of chords, but I wasn't thinking in terms of tonality. I was thinking more in terms of voice leading, which is like a, a name that we give to the idea that every voice, if, if this chord is a five voice chord, and every note within that chord has, a, has its own pathway, you know. So it, going back to wise men say, if you think about it being soprano, alto, tenor, and bass, right, as Bach would think about it. Wise men say, Right, then every one of those those paths needs to have its own melody. So, for example, the the alto part goes. Wise men say, right? I can sing that. The tenor goes. Wise men say, right? Bass goes. Wise men say, and the bass line is always the most important. If you've got these two things going in motion, then that's always very sound. Um, and so, yeah, each of these voices has its own pathway. So, so if I do this crazy, complex kind of chord, it, it's the same principle. Every, every note within the chords kind of needs a, a satisfying destination. If one part's going, then it's not fun to sing and, and you don't emote with it. If every path has a journey and a destination, then you can, you can emote with it. And I don't think you need to understand all these notes and their momentum to, to feel it, you know, because when I, I know when I was a kid, I would hear these chords go past in, you know, Stevie Wonder songs, and I wouldn't know, I didn't know what the chords were, but I felt, I felt them, I felt what the chords did. And I think my, my sort of passion and fascination to this day is, how, how do I reverse engineer that those kinds of emotional reactions to music that I experience as a listener? How do I reverse engineer that as a creator of, of music? And, and it, just, it basically just starts with being curious. You know, it doesn't start with knowing everything or mm -hmm. being aware. It just starts with being open to figuring stuff out. Tell me about growing up. Your mother's a musician. She's yeah. a violin player. Your grandfather is a musician. Yes. Also a violin player? Yes, for sure. Okay. It seems you broke the family curse. You don't play violin. <laughs> yeah. I started playing violin when I was two, and I, I gave up by the age of four. No, I that's, thought, that's I'm, wonderful. I was too impatient. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to go and have a result, you know. But the thing about the violin, um, I mean, it's a, the most beautiful instrument in the whole wide world, but if you pick it up and go, it doesn't sound good for about a year. 
know, mm-hmm. you have to just sort of play open strings for ages before you can even make one note sound good. And I think as a child, I I, I was I didn't have the patience for it. I want I wanted to hit the drum and for it to go bang, and that was so kind of in, instantaneous, you know. So, what was your first instrument after the violin? I suppose my first real instrument was the was the Casio a Casio keyboard. So I think I played something called a CTK11. I think it was called, but it was just a, a, a bog standard, but but excellent keyboard with 200 sounds and 100 rhythms you know so the rhythms you go through all these different genres you have sort of you know bossa nova and and um polka and uh, rock and roll and mm-hmm. stuff like this and it was it was great you know you skip through the things and it would go you know and you go through and and i learned kind of learned how music worked through that thing and then you have these sounds trombone timpani you know vibraphone viola all these sounds that i wouldn't know this, these sounds in the real world unless I'd had access to that instrument. Nowadays, I mean, man, it's crazy now what you can do in, in something like GarageBand or Logic. There's all these extraordinarily well-recorded samples of, you know, full orchestra, synthesizers, drum machines. It's, it's really kind of overwhelming and, and amazing. And I think growing up now as a, as a musician, there's so many things you can play with, which is both thrilling and also tr- tr- troubling because one of the great things about that keyboard is there were just, just 200 sounds. I didn't have any more than 200. Now there's infinite sounds, mm-hmm. you can do any sound in the world. So I loved having that as a device for exploration. There was even a little sampler inside where you could layer things up. So I would do like a, a drum a drum beat. And then I would on the second one, I would do bass line. You know, and then I'd do a piano thing or a brass trumpet or whatever. I'm just playing around and, and music was going in to my mind because my whole family was was musical and there was all in every corner of the house was someone was either playing or listening to music so it wasn't like there was a shortage of material but the, the crucial thing for me was having a keyboard an instrument where I could actually throw paint and for it to stick and when I was seven years old I, I actually got um, this recording software called Cubase which is a, a way in which you can layer tracks in the computer and that was very exciting for me. You know little kids pick out melodies on tiny keyboards, were yeah. you always interested in harmonizing those notes? Yeah, for me it was chords, <laughs> chords first. Chords I, first I don't know why, but melody. Yeah, I mean, melody was 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 inevitable, but but harmony was the thing that I really got got my rocks off on. It was like, whoa, you can. This is crazy. Oh man, that's a that's an unbelievable sound. There's so many things going on there. You know? <laughs> to for for someone like as a kid, for someone with musical ears, to get my ears around. Wow, there's there's five sounds there, and it, but they are together one sound. And there's also within that this sound and this sound, which are two different worlds, and they rub against each other. Oh, and just like the, the rubbing, I mean that that's such a special part of music for me. It's just like the way that notes interact with each other. But as a as a kid, I mean I would sit at the piano. For hours just doing this, and then I'd move one note. It changes everything. Right, note by note it changes. And each one of these is a different universe. It's just a different world. And I, I feel myself moved by them. I, I'm moved by the way that these interact and, and feel. And um, and so, yeah, I think as a kid, yeah, you can take any melody in the world, so that's fine. But it's the way that you clothe it. That, that is really what thrills me the, mm. the most. I'm assuming just watching you, you have perfect pitch. I do, yeah. Do you think that helped you sort of figure out the relationships between the I notes? I think so, yeah. I mean, if you take this sound, you know, being able to hear, being able to ascertain that there's a D, an F sharp, an A, a G sharp, and an E is helpful. I don't think that you need perfect pitch to to become interested and, and very good at this, but um, it's like a sort of um, cheat code, kind of. It's like a ease of access you know being able to say b flat like i know that's a b flat and but without having to check an instrument it, it mostly helps with um with audience singing actually because i don't have to refer to an instrument to get the audience to sing a chord which maybe they say for example the introduction to a song i think i can then sit down and play a song and they, they're already in the key that mm-hmm. i was in but without me to, without me having to check or oh, okay oh you know it's, it's not i can kind of pluck the notes out of my mind and and that that's actually very handy there's nothing 
crazily supernatural about it. I think it's just it's a, it's a, a type of memory that you can develop if you're very familiar with a particular way of thinking and, and working. So there was clearly classical music in your house for sure. Growing up, what other kinds of music was there? You mentioned Stevie Wonder. Where did you first hear Stevie Wonder? Oh, I, well, my mom is like the biggest Stevie Wonder fan. She's just she's all about Stevie. And I think yeah, as a kid, it was just, it was so many, so many parts of Stevie's discography would just be in the house. I remember there's an album he made called Hotter Than July, and the first song on that album is called Did I Hear You Say, and it starts with this like. Oh. And it was so exciting. I remember dancing as a just dancing as a child, thinking, "I can't." So exciting, you know. It's so so fun. He is one of those artists that, even with all the gold records and all the acclaim, he's still strangely underrated. Yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, yeah, underrated is a, it's a funny word, but I think that I think the thing when you're when you get as big as Stevie has gotten is that you're taken at face value as someone who is just big only. And big is big is not the deepest you can be, you know. Big is big is a scale question, not not a breadth or depth mm-hmm. question. And so, Stevie did achieve the the bigness of scale, but I think the thing that he achieved that was more important, and and I think the thing that has stayed the te- that has stood the test of time, and the thing that I revere and all of my peers revere is the depth of what he was doing, sonically, harmonically, vocally, tonally, lyrically, politically. I mean, he's just so in touch with everything, and so. You know, I think the idea that he was able to scale that depth on a, such a global scale is huge. But it's funny when you say, yeah, he's underrated. I think perhaps it's because people think, oh, Steve, oh, yeah, he's really famous, isn't he? You know, he's a, a really famous musician. Or he does lots of songs that everyone knows, which is very true. But the, the deeper you go into Stevie, the more you, you feel. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, like a real sign of greatness is, mm-hmm. is that. Also, don't you worry about a thing. The, mm. the song that made you famous because you did a YouTube right. version of it, that's from his best side of music, I think. Yeah. Second side of Intervisions. I, th- I think it's like the best oh, it's unbelievable. side of any, it's Higher Ground, Jesus, Children of America, You, have, you haven't done love. nothing? Yeah. Don't oh, no, worry. Uh, oh, that, that's fulfilling this. Oh, man, that album is just crazy. Yeah. It's the just, whole album is. The whole and then album. it ends with uh, Mr. Know-It-All. And you're just oh, like, oh, yeah. such an incredible... Uh, God, it's just, it. I mean, such a statement. And I think you can also, you hear when he's, you hear when he's thirsty. And so for me, I think my favorite, currently my favorite Steve album might be Talking Book. And it's not because it's his most refined album or complete as a thought process. It's it's that he's so, he's so thirsty to, to figure it out. He's like, he just wants to write songs. He can, he's just so desperate to, to play around with, with stuff. And mm-hmm. And you can you can feel him being. I mean, he's twenty one when he's doing that album. He's discovering it before our ears, you know, before our eyes. He's figuring it out on that album, and I think that later on in his career, he'd figured it out already more. And I mean, nothing he's ever made has not been tremendous. But I think that there's a youth and a and an experience of gathering and being moved by something in the present about that early stuff where he's he's just he's just ravenous for it and and you can tell that as a as a listener it's interesting reading back about him at that time because there was a point in which motown sort of thought it was over for him that mm-hmm. he was a child prodigy you might sympathize with this because you were mm-hmm. so young when you started yeah. they thought he'd peaked and then i think he he produced that great spinner song right. it's a shame and i always thought that was so unfair because he's not a guitar player primarily but it's one of the greatest guitar licks of all oh, time that's, <laughs> that's like, how like, did he do that yeah how does he do that no i know for sure but the thing that i think with stevie was so cool and i think we need to remember is you know he made that album called where i'm coming from right he was mm-hmm. 20 years old when he made yeah. it and it was kind of his first record after the Motown years where he yeah. sort of thought, okay, this is a statement. And it's a weird album, man. It's, it's dark and gnarly and it's it's not, you know, it's not amongst his most palatable work. But he needed to make that album. I mean, it's, there's some amazing stuff on there. And I think the, the amazing thing is that he was given the chance to make that album. It's like, of course, you, of course, make and we'll put it out. Of course, we'll put it out. Because if he hadn't made that album, if he tried to make a hit record at 20, he wouldn't have done it because he needed to go into that depth and the depth of musical my mind and talking book before he managed to get to something like inner visions you know or songs in the key of life i think that there's this kind of disease that you know you have to make a if someone doesn't make popular music at one point in their career you know well, it's all over for them and it's all mm-hmm. going downhill i think it's a it's a really tragic kind of thing because people underfulfill their potential as experimenters by negating some of the darker or more gnarly interesting strange ideas um, musically, in favor of things which people, which are, more more people will like and relate to, and um, 
you know, I think this is a, a problem that is, is deeper than the music industry. I think it's a, it's a human tendency, I think, to kind of disregard or think of parts of ourselves, the non-palatable or darker parts of our personalities and selves as kind of weaknesses, you mm-hmm. could say, or, or not, not things to be discussed or shared. But I actually think those things those things make us so much, even even more sometimes than the parts of us that are, we've, all, we've got all figured out. It's welcoming those parts of yourself in that makes you a, a deep person and a whole person and a real person because you can't just be the good stuff. You have to welcome in all the stuff. And Stevie is such a shining example of someone who musically really got in touch with the depth of an experiment. And through that came, came around to these totally eternal universal songs, which borrowed from and, and learned from and gleaned from the kind of experiments that were stranger and had he not done, would not have informed those experiments and, and I think would not have made that music c- c- quite so deep. Mm-hmm. Now, as someone who started so young and was popular so young, is that a journey you're conscious of making? I would say so. I think my career started almost by accident. I didn't think of myself as starting off a career when I was making those YouTube videos at home. I thought, oh, I'll just make some videos and it'll be really fun. And m- mostly I, I really... I just wanted to push myself musically as far as I could possibly go in every direction because I was so ravenous for understanding stuff and for playing around with stuff. And so I did that stuff and it was it was almost this kind of this accidental symptom of those experiments that people started to listen to the music. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember I, you know, I got an email from Take Six, my childhood heroes, and, and that was closely followed by an email from Pat Metheny, who's another one of my heroes. And then following that, it was Herbie Hancock. And then finally, it was Quincy Jones. And and I think that's when I sort of thought, gosh, I, perhaps there is something in what I'm doing that you could describe as having a career, being a musician or being an artist. You know, I thought of myself as a someone who is eternally fascinated and, and playing around. And I'm a musician for sure. But I, I don't know if I thought about myself as, a, as an artist for a little while yet. And I suppose it wasn't until I, I made this album called In My Room, which is the first album I made, and I made it on my own in this room in London. That's when I really thought, God, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write some songs, which I hadn't really done much of before. And I put this music into the world. And I think that's when I'll feel like this is my story at the beginning. You know? Even though my story had been going for 20 years before with all the experiments I've been doing, it felt like that was the first time I'd kind of thought, okay, this is a statement that I'm making as a cohesive Jacobian thing. And... Uh, I felt really strongly that I wanted to kind of produce the album myself and mix it myself. And I played every instrument on the album and I, I did every single thing for that album myself. Because there were all sorts of people who thought, oh, can I produce it or can I mix it, whatever. And I, I, was, I was quite firm about doing it myself. In some ways, it, it, regardless as to whether that was even the right thing musically, I think it was definitely the right thing philosophically for me because I was able to learn how it felt to be the author of all the different parts of my experience and my, my, my a- a- exploration and I definitely took my time and, and I'm very glad that I did. And I, I would credit not only Quincy, who, who at that time was, he became a, a sort of godfather slash manager figure to me, mm-hmm. but also someone like my mum, who was just so present in, in the process and very much encouraged me not to rush. I think you know, my mum's never really cared about the idea of, oh gosh, you know, Jacob's a big star or he's got a celebrity. It, it didn't really feature in mm-hmm. her mind. I, I was never put under any pressure. We should point out you're wearing a T-shirt, or you're, sorry, you're wearing a sweatshirt <laughs> yeah. with your mother's name on it. Right, that this, yeah, yeah, Susie Collier, number yeah, it, one fan. Right, this T-shirt, yeah, shirt says Susie Collier's number one fan. It was given to so my mum by a, a fan of my mum's, and that, she that gave it to the, me. That should be the only thing on your merch table. Uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I'm so I'm so here <laughs> for that. She truly is the greatest, and I think she had a way. I mean, even since I was very very young, of not not put me under pressure to be a thing. It was a question more than an answer. It was. How, how do you see the world, Jacob? How do you hear this? How do you experience this? Did you have trouble letting go? Because sometimes people who go into studios, this is the myth of, I don't mean the myth that it's not true, but I mean the mythology of Brian Wilson. He goes in to do Smile and it can't get finished. Yeah, of course. Did you have yeah. trouble just saying at some point, it's got to go out in the world? It has to be done. Yeah, I have I definitely experienced trouble in that way. I think when you have awareness, you're awake to all the different elements of something. Or you, I could just make this... I could turn the kick drum up in 0.5 dB or I could I could EQ out a little bit of 240 hertz from the vocal or oh I could just nudge that drum thing by a tenth of a second you know those kinds of details when you when you're aware of them it's really hard to let go of them because mm-hmm. everything you you hear in your own music when you're making it, it, it becomes the, the, those kinds of zeros and ones if it was just a tiny bit this way then it would be more it would be better it would be more emotional it would be, it would be more a, a more concise statement 
And sometimes as well, it's like it's loosening. Oh, it's too tight. Uh, I need to make it sloppier. Let me just make it a little bit sloppier, and then it's mm-hmm. going to be just right. And, and all this is possible now with it's digital possible. music is, in a way that wasn't available. Yeah, I mean, this is the this ago. is the miracle and and the, the disease of our time is that these tweaks are endlessly possible. So, I mean, exactly as you say, I think there is a, there's a certain point where it's like, well, I I, I need a, a deadline to to work against, you know, so so that things get done or things can be born into the world. Because if there is not a deadline, it's just this utter infinite thing that it could always I could always do a new thing or a fresh thing or a a tweak or whatever that said there are certain things I think that I that I make and have made over the years and I'm experiencing now I'm making where I know that I can't do the thing I did better than the thing that I just did I think when you're faced with total infinity which is one of the kind of privileges and, and challenges of my life creatively there are immense reliefs to be found when you ground yourself in, in, in a particular form. Oh, okay, thank goodness, I found a form. It's one of the reasons I love playing these songs on the road so much is because I'm, I'm, it's, it's totally unlimited, but I'm held together by the fact that there's a song with words mm-hmm. and a beginning, middle and an end and a crowd in a room. There's just the, the right criteria for me to feel actually very free because if I were with a song at home with no audience in my own spare time, it's way for it to gather form because there aren't the confines of uh, yeah, a, a listening crowd, an audience who can sing and who, who are aware and, and awake to the music and a certain amount of time in the set that I need to fill. You know, all these things that make that possible. I think for me, uh, yeah, one of the, the, the creative quests of my life is, is ways to contain my ideas and my essence. And when I do it well, I think it's, uh, you know, a, a concise expression of infinity. That's kind of what I aim for. And uh, it, it's much easier said than done because... I find that, there, that yeah, there's so much in the world to express and explain and there's so many ways to say things. But there are those times, even say with the English language, where you say something with a sentence in a way that it could not have been better said than the way you said it. That's like writing a song where you think, well, I don't need to try and write that song ever again because I've already written it. It's done. And that's always such a relief. You think, oh, gosh, it's done. I, I finished. It's, it's good. And, and those moments are very uh, kind of seldom and very, very welcome to me. You know, you're making me think of the famous psychologist Steven Pinker. Years ago at a conference, outraged a lot of people by saying that music had no evolutionary value. It it was not valuable in the evolution of people. And a lot of other uh, neuroscientists have said, well, actually, it's one of the crucial ways we learn cause and effect and expectation. Just as you said, every note you're playing, it, it has a home it's trying to get to. Mm. And that's something that, that actually children learn from songs. To- oh, totally. Whereas, you know, Pinker, I mean, the awful world he was painting, I don't mean in general, but of music, is that it's sort of formless and it does, it does go on forever and you can't contain it. Yeah. Well, I suppose then that brings up the philosophical question of whether something that goes on forever has value in the present. Uh, or, or even in, in gathering form over, say, generations. I, I, I would say, I, yeah, I would say music is very, very similar to language, spoken language or visual language or whatever. And I think that as people, we naturally have a, a yearning for and a gift for connecting and, and communicating ideas to each other. It's one of the things we do best. And music is, is one of the more delicious dialects kind of in, in which we can do this. But you can express by screaming or shouting or stamping or roaring or talking or crying or laughing, whatever these things. And I think music is a, it's, it's like an, an extended limb of these sensations in, in life. And it's a really visceral kind of colouring palette where you can, you're can you able to be very descriptive. If we stop communicating in person with each other, if we end up being siloed within our own languages, our kind of digital languages, and we don't connect and communicate, I think that's when we stop evolving because we evolve from each other, with each other, by each other's ways, each on our own terms, but as a collective. And I think that music has a, an accelerated gift at offering people experiences that give them access to that. I think we've learned that's not what technology provides. It's like a mirror, in a sense. It's an extension of our natural, very pure wish to form meaningful connections with each other. And, you know, I would say musically, I mean, we were discussing earlier on the idea of, you know, 200 sounds on a Casio versus, you know, two million sounds in musical software, I, both sides are real. You could say, well, what a pity, you know, there's so many possibilities and so so little guidance, you know, it's hard to make, make a start or it's hard to be whatever. But you could also say, well, what, what an immense cathartic relief that our children have a way of playing with sounds that truly is as infinite as the world. And the only limit is their imaginations. And so technology, I mean, it's enabled me to 
to have a career, to share music with the world, to create visual form, musical form, to collaborate with, you know, hundreds of musicians all over the world over FaceTime and WeTransfer and Dropbox and all these kinds of things, let alone amassing a, a, a digital audience. And I think, you know, being able to share meaningful things with the world just as much as it's distracted me as the same with everyone else from the real world and takes me out of the present and all sorts of things but it's a, a double-edged sword and it's able if we choose to really augment the parts of us that make us really human although for you you have the experience now of playing in concert in which you're bringing all these people into your songs growing up did you play with each other around the house was sort of collaborative music a part of your growing up very much so. So we all sing in my house. So, mm-hmm. so my family is like me, my mum, and my, my two my two little sisters, and and so we we sing. I was mentioning Bach earlier on SATB, soprano alto tenor bass. We sing four part uh, Bach chorales, Christmas carols, like whenever we possibly can. Whenever we have a day where we're all four in the house, which now is actually quite seldom, but we'll sing. It's such a delight. It's so, so nice. And at school, you know, I started lots of bands at school. I wore different hats. You know, I I started like an an African drumming ensemble with a bunch of djembe drums. And I started an improvisation group where everyone just improvised. And I I played drum kit in my concert band at school. And I I did some arrangements for the the school choir. And I sang in the school choir. So I I was kind of trying these different outfits of working with other people. And I really had, had a good time doing it. But I found that my fundamental learning happened when I took whatever I learned home and applied that to my own kind of internal introverted tapestries, you know. And I think it's over, only over the last 10 years or so that I've really kind of learned the skills, or I'm still learning the skills of, of unpacking those internal scientific balanced worlds and presenting them to people in, in real life, you know. And it, it's funny, I've, I've spoken to people, some artists I, I really respect who are really young and people who, who blew up kind of over quarantine through videos online and, and now are faced with this challenge of how do I, wh- what is playing live? You know, how do I tour? Mm-hmm. It's such, such a different thing to do from setting up your phone on, on portrait mode and just playing a song and, and having nice lighting. It's such a different thing to stand on stage and say, not just th- I'm going to sing the right notes and play my song, but actually communicate that to a room. And I had to figure that out over a, about a year or two when I first started touring because I, I toured with a, a, a pretty ambitious setup. I toured with a one-man show. So it was me in the center of a circle of about 12 different musical instruments and I was in the middle essentially playing them all at once. So I would play bass and it would loop and drums and it would loop and keys and it would loop and guitar and it would loop. Then I'd sing and I'd play harmonizer and it was and I'd do a piano solo over the thing I'd loop then it would change key. And it was It was a very, very kind of involved production and it was it was quite singular from a technological standpoint it mm-hmm. hadn't really hadn't really been done in that way before and so a lot of it I was figuring out as, as as much as anyone else was figuring it out but I think for the first kind of year or so of touring a year and a half of touring I was I was just learning how to play music on stage and feel comfortable and be cool with the fact that there was an audience there that was listening in and, and a part of it and you know, I, I wouldn't say I was, I was, you know, hugely nervous or anything, but I, I would just say I, I hadn't figured out how to really enjoy and, and be comfortable in, in a situation where I'm under that kind of pressure. And and now, I, I mean, I'm more at home on stage than I am in many other areas of my life. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm like a fish in water on stage. And I think I've just, I've learned how to not only kind of survive and cope under pressure, but just alchemize it into the optimum comfort and creativity and I think that it takes time to do that and I don't think you can just spring out of the box straight from YouTube or Instagram onto the stage and you know you're fully formed but because I think that all the nuances of how to build a build a performance like that take time I mean I'm very very aware of all the different elements of my show for example that I ta- I've been touring this year you know we got as I say six musicians on stage playing all sorts of different kinds of things and you know even down to the the, the set design and the lighting you know I've, I've sat with the, the lighting uh, operator his name is John John Rogers and sat with him and crafted exactly the tone of the green that is triggered when Christian the drummer plays the snare sound you know go and a green light will go Ooh. but it's like is that dark green or medium green or light green and how much neon is in the green how many decimals of a second does it take for that green to fade out does it go or you know and so all these kinds of forms they're all part of the music they're all part of the expression and it sounds kind of cerebral when I say it out loud but actually it's just a natural extension of a communication form that I've been familiar with just by being a human and being watching the world and thinking but it's it's right for there to be a blackout when this word is said or it's right for the lights to go from left to right rather than right to left because 
the attention needs to be moved to this musician or away from this thing or and, and all those degrees I think that as a creator of shows I, I think I've I've developed and I'm developing more and more skills that the more I do it and I think that that it's the same same was same same is true for everyone I think the same is true, was true for the one man show I didn't really understand what I was doing at that time but I was learning so fast and so much and and what a privilege to be able to learn in you know in the real world with with real people and mm-hmm. it still boggles my mind to still now to go to a city and turn up on a stage and, and there's 2000 people who somehow they found my songs <laughs> it's a crazy <laughs> feeling i mean it's just it never gets old i i never walk out and think well of course there were people here you know it's, it's mm-hmm. like why would why would people know my song why would they know my songs you know it's just it's an astonishing thing and and something i take very seriously as someone who kind of builds experiences and shares things with the world in terms of i want to communicate the best i could possibly possibly communicate about how i feel as a human because that's my duty as an artist i i must explain the world as i see it because if people are turning up i, I mean I, what a privilege to be in that position and and i say i take it seriously with the lightest possible touch you know because you could say life is very serious but it's also to be taken very lightly and i think the same is true with with music Thanks to Jacob Collier again for sitting down to talk to us about his career and about his process and about some insane musical theory. You can hear piano ballads and all of our favorite Jacob Collier songs on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Ben Tolliday, Eric Sandler, Jennifer Sanchez, our editor is Sophie Crane. Our executive producer is Mia LaBelle. And if you like our show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond.